Okay, this is the intro to the recording for the Friday Night Bible Study for the ninth day of November 2018. We'll give the Hebrew date when we go live in just a moment on Facebook Live Sabbath Service page. And let's go ahead and uh, we'll open with this, this music, not here, but over here. And uh, as soon as we get a green light from Facebook Live, we'll go live. friends i let the music go all the way because we were working on something uh to get our closed captions fixed and even though i went on my uh personal page my main page of facebook and said well we'd go ahead and sign on without the closed captions by just dog-eared persistence with it and some prayer and I'm probably some of you pitched in because i've asked you when we have problems if you would please Help me pray that God will help us get us get them fixed. And voila, just before I said, okay, I'll just go ahead and sign on without the closed captions, other than just try, you know, other than spend the entire Bible study time trying to fix it, and then, then the evening's gone or shot, and we're halfway through it now. Anyway, welcome to those of you watching on Facebook Live. I hope you had a good week. You know, whenever I say that, I do understand, brethren, that your week is going to include all kind of trials, as as yours, as certainly mine has as as well. That that is uh, that's just part of what we can expect. You know, and we learn and we grow by trials. If we don't, you know. If we don't give in the wrong way, if we resist the devil and watch as he flees from us. Brother, I got Mr. Armstrong tonight, and I've got the subject he's going to do tonight dovetails into one we, we will be following up with in the morning during the, the Sabbath service, uh, a.m. to the U.S., p.m. to the U.K., this uh, ser sermon Mr. Armstrong did in 1978 in Big Sandy to the college students at the uh, campus in Big Sandy in 1978. You'll see Paul, Paul uh, uh, Peter. You'll see Peter, uh, one of my old roommates. Um, I was just talking with Paul Kiefer earlier this week by email. We're going to be getting together in the next week or two uh in the Birmingham area, Paul is now living in Mobile, even though he serves brethren in Germany. He was over there for the feast, and uh, he's offered to do some help on our World Watch program. And we'll, we'll see how my lunch with him goes over that as we talk. And, and, uh, t and I take a look at some of the German uh, reports he's given me to look at. You know, I appreciate that. Uh, old college friend Paul Kiefer. He was in the class I started in. Paul was a three-year student, so instead of going four years, he graduated in three years in the class. Of, he started out in the class of what would have been 74 in 1970, but then graduated in the class of 73 that he became an alumnus of. Uh, all right, now, Mr. Armstrong, I said we got two, uh, two uh, programs Hang on one second. Let me bring him in tight for just a moment. Let's see. He's on screen. 
three over here. Mr. Armstrong, let me just put you there, bring you forward for a moment. I see her closed captions, even though I've got them back. They're not quite working the way they should be. It's I, I don't think I ever said the word Lucy's, but let's see. I think it's working pretty well. We I've got it very fine-tuned to work with Mr. Armstrong's voice. So, and when Mr. Armstrong comes on, I can run into to the other room and and check that if I need to. But, ah, uh, oh, there you go. It's freed up now. Thank you. Let me come back for a second as I introduce Mr. Armstrong on this this uh, sermon excerpt he's going to give tonight. will be on the need for the church. And then from the very same sermon, we'll take another part of that sermon in the morning and play it where he is talking about God's church in action. And that, Compared to where we are today and right now as a scattered and much divided church, you know, shame on us that we're divided. Now, um, that we're scattered, that's kind of a shame, too. God has allowed that, and it is in the Psalms. David refers to uh, when God, when we're scattered, it's a punishment. And, uh, and yet... It can be a, a punishment that need not be um, too stressful because it can cause us and should cause us, should have caused us to be fasting and praying more to God during this time of scattering. And he likes that. If he sees, okay, while I've left you in a certain form of punishment, scattered, you're seeking me harder why, he can be pleased with that and say, well, look, I like this so much, I'm just going to leave you scattered a little more. Keep up the prayer, and I'll keep the blessings in your lives individually. And, you know, and, and then, brethren, as I have fasted and prayed about this much, saying, God, why have you left us scattered? And what's the deal about all these blankety, blank, banana peeling Church of God groups that have divided us? Not just several dozen times, but several hundreds times over. What about that? You know, and God, first of all, began to bring into focus into my mind something Mr. Armstrong used to teach us. And when I asked Mr. Armstrong personally, privately, on campus one time, I said, Mr. Armstrong, you know the book, that book uh, you did on the seven laws of success? You know, man, that's very outstanding and wonderful and but one of them is on setting the right goals and your examples are mostly you know and of course you say uh, you know that our goal setting should be with prayer and i said uh, but most of the those goals as examples you give are goals you set in your life for the personal things of your life well you know for example everything from what your occupation and job might be to who your wife might be and you know, or vice versa, your husband, you know, your mate might be. And maybe you'd even get into specifics with God about, yeah, God, what would be the best car for me for what you've got in mind for me to purchase? Or in some cases, you know, somebody walks up and gives you one. <laughs> Has somebody in your family or somebody, somebody else. I know somebody in the church in the Los Angeles area that uh, a young lady, nice young lady, gave this elderly man who needed a car she bought him a car that wasn't a brand spanking new car but it was still a nice car she gave him a car my brother in my case i had a truck pickup truck i was driving everybody in alabama i mean you you, you if you don't have a pickup truck that's the first vehicle you got to get get you you got to have a pickup truck if you're in alabama that's just you know you can't go to any tailgate get together unless you got a pickup truck you know everybody lets down the tailgate y'all sit on the back of you back your tail ends of your car up in a circle and you sit on the tailgate. Somebody stands out in the middle, gets on a soapbox and preaches. <laughs> no, I'm taking that a little further than it actually goes, but people sit on their tailgates for a lot of things. And, you know, but my brother gave me a little BMW after he bought a brand new car. He gave me his old one, his old, um, what's that series called? BS, BMW, I don't know. It's, a, it's the one with the letter that means it's the real tiny little dinky small car, four-cylinder. I love it. Because 
on the budget I operate on, it just fits in there perfect. I get to drive three or four times as much as I would on the gasoline budget if I was doing it all in that gas-guzzling truck. <laughs> but let's get to Mr. Armstrong. We'll talk more. I just wanted to do a little warm-up before he speaks. And I do want to pay, I do want to let you know, if you stick around after Mr. Armstrong finishes, uh, some of the questions that a number of you have asked me in, not emails, but mostly on Facebook. Boy, Facebook's taken over as the email thing, you know, Messenger. Everybody does the Messenger thing. I really like email better, frankly, because it's just, to me, it's it's one two one two, you know, back and forth. Uh, send a thing, reply, and you, and you got it there. You can look at it anytime. Facebook, you got to go, you know. But that works anyway. And people, and you get a notice. You got a question. If some of you, some of you, uh, wish you could boil down your questions. You know, I have to read a book before we get to. Oh, here's the question, <laughs> hidden in the seventeenth paragraph, and then there's twenty seven more paragraphs after that, um, that you know you focusing on that if I don't see that question I missed what you were writing me about but there's some uh, that I did catch your questions and those, if I can look those up real quick while Mr. Armstrong is speaking I'll come back afterward and address those in the follow-up to Mr. Armstrong so let's go to him again what he's going to be speaking on tonight is the need for the church and you know, the church, before he comes on with that, let's just keep in mind this, brethren. As you know from several scriptures, that the church is comprised of its members. It's not a building, you know, the church. It may have a building. Uh, we, as the church, as members, may have a building, but that building is not the church, not the way the Catholic and the Protestant world talk about their their church is, you know, that's our church. They appoint to it on some corner. Well, that's just a building on the corner. It's the building that a group of people that call themselves a church group, you know, meet in. And it's not a, it's not a organization of men. It's not any denomination. The church, God's church, the church of God, is its members, you and me. And so, and when God says the gates of hell will never will not prevail against His church, He's not talking about a building like losing the Ambassador Auditorium for a time to apostates who decided to sell it off and put the money in their pension funds. Boy, did they <laughs> did they pull one off with that? They sold a building that many people sacrificed many of their lunches and dinners and sometimes all-day meals and fasting, to be able to put aside just a little extra money into the building fund. As Mr. Armstrong asked those who are showing a hot Philadelphia-type attitude to do, and many, many, many hundreds, and I probably wouldn't be wrong to say thousands of brethren did, to build up that building fund so that Mr. Armstrong was able to take that as a hefty down payment, borrow the money from the Reader's Digest, uh, financing people, and uh, have the money before we started to be able to finish what would be started, and that without taking away from the normal church operations that are comprised of the, uh, that comprise the, uh, I'm hearing a funny noise. You know, I wonder what's putting that in our circuit. Have I got something plugged in here that's adding some noise to this thing? Maybe. Let me yank something out. That still does it. See what happens here. Ah, some of that's coming from there. What about here? Oh, that's predominantly where it's coming from. Right there. Well, just get that volume knob down. Okay. All right. I could hear that on the monitor speaker way over there. My microphone turns off certain close-by speakers, but on the corner speaker, speaker way over in the corner, I could hear some rattling noise. Perhaps you were hearing it in the background, too. Now you notice a little quieter. That was kind of rat razzing me and rattling me. All right, but I do need to hurry, and we want to get to Mr. Armstrong, but I was talking about the building fund that... Uh, 
a lot of people sacrifice for, and then to see the apostates just callously, without even saying, let's pray and ask God for his will, they would just say, let's pray we get this building sold. Well, that may not be God's will, fellows. But they showed they didn't care what God's will was anyway, <laughs> they, with a, that and a lot of other things. Uh, however, as I, as, although I, as I say that, I do realize and recognize that could have become God's will as he said, all right, look, I'm going to let my people lose that building. I want to make sure, you know, you understand that you are the temple and that that's not greater than you, that to me, you are greater than that, the spiritual temple that God is building, that he, God, has allowed to be scattered. And, and he's allowing the dividing, but he's certainly not in the dividing, brethren. But uh, maybe you'll be able to pick up on that. Maybe there'll be something in what Mr. Armstrong says tonight. Let's all listen carefully as Mr. Armstrong speaks on, on this on tonight. Let's see. I'm gonna, let me flip this over and just as he starts, let me put up his logo, his name instead of mine. All right. How come that's not going on screen? Okay, it'll, it'll come on when I switch, I think, to this screen. So let's go now to uh, Mr. Armstrong speaking from 1978 in Big Sandy on the need for the church. Sandy, Texas. And I want to continue on in this series that I have been going through uh, the last several weeks on television. Why did Jesus Christ raise up the church? What do we need a church for? And why didn't he just save individuals alone by themselves? Why do we need a church with an organization? What is the church for? What is its purpose? The real purpose and function of the church simply has not been understood. Well, Jesus came. Now, what he did first, he called his disciples. But he had to meet Satan, and he had to meet him head on. And he had to overcome Satan. Now, the record of that, it was the most titanic struggle that has ever been uh, in all history. Between, it was between two antagonists at this time, but Satan was trying to overpower overcome and destroy Jesus Christ. Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights without a morsel of food or a drop of water. And let me tell you, he was hungry. Now, the two greatest temptations that could possibly come to a man, especially ordinary, is hunger. But in that condition, it was super hunger. He was so hungry. But the other one, if not even a greater one, is vanity. So Satan came and said, if you be the son of God, you just perform a miracle and turn these stones into bread and then you can eat. He appealed to his desire to eat and perform a miracle. He challenged, if you're the son of God. You know, an average uh, human being today would have said, what do you mean if I'm the son of God? I'll show you whether I'm the son of God. And he would immediately have fallen into the trap and he turned the stones into bread and have had a meal right there. And he would have fallen into Satan's trap. Well, Satan put him to three very supreme tests. But Jesus finally snapped out of command and says, Now I'm in command. You get out of here. And Satan got. And Christ qualified to restore the government of God on this earth and to set up the kingdom of God. He had to qualify and he could not preach the good news of the coming kingdom of God until someone had qualified to rule it and to overcome Satan and to uh, be a successor to the former Lucifer that was on the throne of the earth. So now Jesus was. Uh, Jesus had qualified. Now those called in to the church must qualify with him. Let me just, if you will turn to Revelation 2 and verse 321. To him, Jesus wrote these words after he descended to heaven. To him that overcometh 
will I grant to sit with me in my throne as I also overcame. Now Jesus had to overcome Satan to qualify to replace Satan on that throne. Satan was on the throne. And let me tell you, if you're going to, to qualify to sit with him on that throne, you have to overcome Satan. Now then, I tell you that mankind has been cut off from God for 6,000 years. They haven't been lost. They haven't been saved. They just have not been judged. And the greatest fallacy, the most universal error that is believed in all kinds of Christendom and all churches and denominations is that if you're not saved, you are lost. And then you've got to get everybody saved now. And that is not true. Now Jesus Christ himself said in John 6, 44, No man can come unto me except the Father which sent me draw him. Now you can't dispute that. Jesus Christ said that. That's what he said. And that's what he meant. No man can come to him except the Father draws him. And God is only drawing those that have been predestinated to be called now, and they're called for some special job. Then the church has been called for a special job. What is it? Most people in that church don't know it. They don't know what they're called for. They think they're called to get, get, get salvation. Satan is the great getter. You were called to give. Give. That's God's way. That's the way of God's law. Love is giving, outgoing love away from self. No, there's no scripture that can nullify that when Jesus said, no man can come to me unless the Father calls him. Well, Jesus was crucified. He was resurrected. And uh, he was... Uh, three days and three nights in the tomb. And then after his resurrection, he was with his disciples for 40 days. He had taught them. They had seen him proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He taught it to them so they could go proclaiming that same good news, which is really an announcement of what God is going to do, not an asking of what we want to do or whether we are willing to uh, come in on it or not. Well, now in Acts, the first chapter in the third verse, here, uh, Jesus was resurrected. It says here, under the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he, Jesus, showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. He taught the kingdom of God. And after, in that forty days after his resurrection, he still was teaching them the kingdom of God. Jesus had gone about all the cities and villages preaching in their synagogues, teaching the kingdom of God. In other words, announcing it's going to come, whether you like it or whether you don't. You don't have to agree with it. You're not, it doesn't require a vote or anything of the kind. Well, then came what we call the day of uh, Pentecost, and originally it was called the day of first fruits because it is the first harvest and is intended to show us that God isn't saving everybody now, only those he's calling to special duty, to a special mission. And if he calls you now, it isn't just to get saved, to get your salvation, it's to give of something for him. I wonder how many of you believe that. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. Now then, I want to show you what that mission is. Well, we come to this day of Pentecost, Acts 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost, or the day of Feast of first fruits, was fully come, they, and if you look back to the 15th verse of the chapter before, it tells you that the they were the 120. After three and a half years of Christ preaching to thousands upon thousands of people, only 120 believed him. More believed on him, but only 120 believed him and followed him. Now, it was that 120 were all with one accord in one place. They really believed what he said. And now, suddenly, the Holy Spirit came in a way it has never come since. 
It came in something they saw, like flames of fire, tongues of fire. They heard the sound of a rushing mighty wind. Pentecostal people today don't have anything like that. That has never been repeated since. Let's turn over here to the 41st verse. Then they which gladly received Peter's word, and he preached a sermon, were baptized in that same day. If you'll notice, not that the disciples talked them into being converted, but rather God added. God has not sent us out to talk people into being converted. God has sent us out to announce the good news of the coming wonderful world tomorrow. A world of peace, a utopia on earth. Not the doom of everything. We're not prophets of doom. We're prophets of hope in the church of the living God. That same day were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Well, that was added to the 120. Now, if you take verse 47 of the second chapter, praising God, and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. They weren't saved yet, but they were going to be. It isn't that the apostles, I want you to get that. The, the meaning is very specific there. It doesn't say the apostles talked them into it. But God added. They merely made an announcement, and they told the, the facts and the truth. And uh, some people were pricked in their heart and they believed it and in their mind. Now then, they got a different mind, the mind of the Holy Spirit, once they uh, really do believe in Christ. Well, now, a day or two later, you come over here to the fourth chapter, and uh, Peter and Paul were uh, going into the temple, and here was a cripple. It was very well known. He'd been a cripple from birth, and he was a beggar, and he's right there where everybody saw him. And they healed him, and he just leaped up, and instantly he was leaping and running and walking. Now, that was a miracle because the average man, even if he was healed, would have to learn to walk, and it would take him a few weeks at least to learn to walk all over. But uh, this man was instantly healed. Notice now in verse 1 to 4, as they speak unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon us, Peter and John, being grieved that they taught the people, and they preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in the hold, or the prison, until the next day. Going on to uh, the 18th verse. And the next morning now, they called them Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor to teach in the name of Jesus. They were called before the priests and the dignitaries, and that was a frightening thing. They'd spent the night in jail. It says then in verse 21, too, and uh, when they had further threatened Peter and uh, John, they let them go. Now, they were a little bit frightened. They were human, and they had been to some extent intimidated. And uh, uh, the apostles, uh, what did they do? They went to the members that God had added to the church. Notice in the fourth chapter now in verses 23. And being let go, they went to their own company, that is, in the church. And reported all the things that the priests and the elders had said to them. And when they heard it, they lifted up their voice unto God with one accord. Notice they were with one accord. There weren't any division. Uh, between them, and said, Lord, thou art God, which hast made heaven and earth and the sea. And they asked God to send the Holy Spirit and to strengthen these men and encourage them that they could go on preaching the word. Verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and uh, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spake the word of God with boldness. They went right on doing it. Now I want you to notice further. Savage persecution had set in in the 8th chapter of Acts in verse 1. Saul was consenting unto Stephen's death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem 
Now this comes to about 33 A.D. The uh, church was uh, raised up and born in 31 A.D. This was within about two years. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. A terrible persecution came in. Now just a little bit later, James was martyred and uh, uh, Peter was taken, once again put in prison. Now then, I'd like to have you notice the Great Commission. You notice in Matthew 28, and I want to read this to you in the Revised Standard Translation too, but it says here in the beginning of the 16th verse, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee unto a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they, the, the disciples, the eleven, saw Jesus, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them. Unto whom? The eleven disciples. Judas already had left, and they had not yet appointed Matthias to take his place at that time. All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and here it says, and teach all nations. Now, some construe that to mean go out and talk everybody into being converted. It doesn't say anything of the kind. It doesn't mean it. Teach. To, to get to understand that, you need to get it as it is in the Revised Standard Translation. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Make disciples. Now, a disciple is a student or a learner. One that is listening, but not necessarily agreeing, but being taught. In the, in, the, in the King James, it's go and teach in all nations. It doesn't mean to teach everybody. Did they go and teach everybody in China and Japan and India? Of course not. That hasn't been done to this day. And that isn't what Christ commissioned them to do. Baptizing them. Now, who would they baptize? The only ones who could believe were those that God had called. Jesus said so. No man can come to me except the Father draw him. No man could come to him otherwise. Therefore, make disciples of all nations, and baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. It's just teaching, but not talking them into anything. And I think that we have misunderstood so much of that. Herbert W. Armstrong will return right after this message. The church is not a worldly organization. Let me repeat that. Now listen. The church is not a worldly organization. It is not a carnal-minded organization. It is a spiritual-minded, spiritual organism. But it is organized. Even though it's a spiritual organism, it is organized. Now then... If you're building a building and the church is compared to a building and you have to have a foundation, what is the foundation? I want you to notice now in Ephesians, the second chapter, verse 19, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Household of God is the family of God. We're begotten to be born of God at the resurrection. And are built upon the foundation. Now, what is the foundation of the church? Here it is. The foundation of the apostles, that's the apostles of the New Testament, and the prophets, the prophets of the Old Testament, whose prophecies were for us today, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together, together, not separated. It's got to be organized. It's got to be together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. The church now is like a building, and as compared to a building, it is a temple. And it is the temple to which Christ is going to come. Now, I'm coming back to that, but I'd like to turn back for just a moment to the prophecy of Haggai, which is a prophecy for today, and uh, in the not Old Testament teaching at all. This is a prophecy for today. I'll just read a few verses here is primarily the word of God to Zerubbabel, who was the governor and also the builder of the second temple after Solomon's temple had been destroyed. Now, this was 70 years uh, later than the destruction of Solomon's temple. 
And uh, they had gone back, a company had gone back. There was Ezra and Nehemiah as prophets, but uh, Zerubbabel was the governor and the builder of the temple. And uh, jo uh, the Joshua was the high priest. For thus says the eternal of hosts, yet once in a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. Now, when is he talking? When is this? He was talking about men way back there 400 years before Christ, 450. And I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Eternal of hosts. They were building that second temple. Now, Christ came to that temple in his first coming. The silver and the gold is mine, saith the Eternal of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. The glory of that building they built didn't even remotely compare to the glory of Solomon's temple. And yet it says the glory of this latter house will be greater. And it's talking about the time when God shakes all the nations. And that hasn't come yet. That's going to happen in a very few years in our lifetime, in our generation. That's when it's going to happen. The temple to which he is coming is going to be more glorious. When Jesus came the first time, he came to the temple that had been the temple of old covenant Israel. It was a physical building. They were a physical carnal people. This time he's coming to a spiritual temple that will be filled with glory and it will be the church then resurrected and glorified and married to Christ in the marriage of the Lamb. That's the temple to which he's coming, the church. And the church has got to be built the way Christ wants it. That's part of the purpose of the church. Now then, let's uh, get back now to Ephesians again. In the fifth chapter of Ephesians, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church. Now, it says later, this is a mystery, but we speak of, uh, 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 of the church, which will become the bride of Christ. And uh, the church is to marry Christ. Now, the old covenant Israel was, uh, was married to God, or it was the one who became Christ, but they were not faithful. But they didn't have God's Holy Spirit. They were not subject to the law of deed, neither of God, neither indeed could be. Uh, but now, uh, you will notice it's going to be different. You notice now in uh, Revelation 19, verses 6 and 7. And I heard, and this is the time of com the coming of Christ. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and uh, the voice of many waters and many waters rushing. If you go over to Niagara Falls and you'll hear it. It's quite a thundering sound. As the voice of mighty thundering saying, Hallelujah! For the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Christ is coming to reign and to rule. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb. Christ is that Lamb has come and his wife hath made herself ready. Are we making ourselves ready, brethren? We are the temple to which he's coming. Now, let's get back and get some of these scriptures together while we're at it. And now notice here in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11. But all of these worketh that one and the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. That is, to which job or what function you have in the church. We don't all do the same thing. For as the body is one... And there's only one church. There are not two churches. There are not three churches. There are not hundreds of churches. They're not God's churches. Satan has this world deceived, and there are many that are Satan's churches, but there's only one church of God. But all these are the selfsame spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. God decides. God has decided who's going to be uh, uh, an apostle who's going to be this and that and the other thing. Christ said to his disciples, you didn't choose me, I chose you. 
For as the body is one and hath many members, and all of the members of that one body being many are one body, not a lot of different churches. For by one spirit are we all baptized into the one body, only one church. Now you're either in the church of God or you're out of it. And if you're out of it, it makes me think of the uh, advertising slogan. They're always coming up with something in beer and cigarettes and one thing and another. They used to have a cigarette ad saying they satisfy. Now, I don't think they do. But I know what does satisfy. It's the Spirit of God. There's another one. If you're out of slits, you're out of beer. And let me tell you, if you're out of the church, you're just out of Christ. And don't you forget it. There's just one body. There is one church. And Christ is the head of that church. Now, in closing, I just want to say again, this book, booklet, I want to mention again, just what do you mean conversion? There is no booklet like this. Very few people understand what conversion is. And I'll tell you, it's about 99 and 44 one hundredth percent impure and misleading today of the teaching in the world. If you want the truth, you don't have to pay for it. This booklet is free. What do you mean conversion? And the other one is what do you mean born again? What is it to be born again? You know, even heads of government sometimes don't know what it means to be born again. And you need to know what it really means. This booklet will make it plain, and there is no, uh, absolutely no refutation of it one way or the other. It's the plain word of God. Very plain, very simple. So now I will say, I've about talked myself out, and I've about worn you out, I'm afraid. So uh, I'll say goodbye for now until the next time. This is Herbert W. Armstrong saying goodbye, friends. At the Worldwide Church of God. All right, brethren, we're coming back for just a little follow-up on that. Uh, after hearing Mr. Armstrong, wow, what a sermon expert. Would you not uh, excerpt? Would you not agree? Um, indeed, what a sermon excerpt. Wow, we are one church. And there's, there's one church of God, not many. Some of you are fellowshipping in places that call themselves the blankety-blank this and the blankety-blank that Church of God group. And, you know, they've set that as if they were the only Church of God is what their leaders intend. You know, we're it over here. And then others are saying, no, we're it over there. And it's all splintered off of the work God began through Mr. Armstrong. Uh, I found some scriptures that uh, I'll share with you about being scattered and how, you know, there's, there's over a hundred scriptures. If you were to look up the word scatter in a concordance, uh, electronic concordance makes it very easy. A couple of them pop up in Proverbs chapter 20, one in verse 8, I think it is. Yeah, verse, that's the first one. A king that sits in the throne of judgment scattereth away all evil with his eyes. Now, that's, that's a s small reference. Verse tw 26 in Proverbs 20 says there, A wise king scattereth the wicked and brings the wheel over them. And if you look up a lot of the other scriptures that refer to scattering and being scattered, you can see that it's, it's a punishment. It's a punishment. And and yet, now, Lillian, if you were to share this with a lot of your grandkids, I'll say hello to your grandkids if your grandma Lillian has shared this with you and you and other young kids and others that are saying, well, what's with y'all old people's church there, you know, what that you want us to pay attention to? It's all scattered. It's confusing because this group in our own, right in our own town where there used to be one congregation of several hundred people. Now there's several dozen different blankety blank this, blankety blank that Church of God groups that are all claiming to stem off of God's end time apostle Herbert Armstrong, but, but 
at the same time sometimes. One's meeting over here, one's meeting over there. Now, maybe maybe in some cases you have one that is meeting at 10.30 in the morning. You got another one meeting at 2.30 in the afternoon. And if you really wanted some fellowship, it wouldn't be like going to one place and being able to fellowship with all the several hundred people of brethren in any one given community or area or city, you know, big city. Uh, but you'd catch a few dozen here, a few dozen there, maybe. Maybe you find some group that's part of the bigger chain of of banana peeling church of God groups that, you know, maybe they got 70 or 80 over there. and You know, you, so you can fellowship with some of your old brethren friends or just, you know, have some elbow uh, touching, you know, some handshakes, some of the right arm of fellowship a little bit. Um, but you got to go, if you want to see everybody you knew, you're going to find this old friend over here and that old friend over there and some third friend over in some third place even yet. And uh, let me see, how did one of the people put it here on Facebook to me? Uh, Mr. Arshang believed he would take us to a place of safety. Well, yes, he did believe that for a long time, but in his latter years, he began to say, brethren, I may, it, you know, God may let me die. And in, as he got in his last months, you know, he was picking a different man every week and kind of analyzing and letting that man know, you know, you're the, you're the, the pick of the moment. And, um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, you know, at the end of the week, after he's really evaluated this man or that man that he had given it to, he would decide, no, that's not the man. Let's pick another one. And uh, as Aaron Dean, his assistant at the time, put it from being very, very close to Mr. Armstrong, Aaron sensed and felt that when Mr. Armstrong, when, yeah, when Mr. Armstrong got to Joseph Tkach Sr., he said, and, and, and this is uh, his assistant, Aaron Dean, saying this. He said, um, that's the man God wanted to follow Mr. Armstrong because God knew what the man might do, even though a lot of us weren't going to see it for years later. But uh, as Aaron put it, that's the man God wanted to have, the pastor generalship, follow Mr. Armstrong. And so during that week, during that time, God allowed Mr. Armstrong to die so that Mr. Armstrong would not change it again. <laughs> so, and I believe Aaron's got it pegged on that. And um, because God wanted to, he, like Mr. Armstrong was, when Mr. Armstrong was pounding on the lectern and saying, brethren, and he raised the number to 90% of you aren't getting it. He for a long time was saying half of you aren't getting it. And then he changed the number to 90% of you, 90% of you aren't getting it. And kind of, when he hit that number, I thought, wow, I only leave one out of 10 people in here who are maybe getting it. And um, and even then, uh, you know, are, is, are they, is each one of those one out of 10, which, you know, it's just a number, but are they getting it all? And what is it Mr. Armstrong's really focusing on or thinking of that people aren't getting? I used to ask God in prayer a lot with fasting, and I believe I understand that now, But and some of you do too. And it's very obvious because the large number of people that went with the apostasy, they weren't getting it at all, maybe. Maybe hadn't even really been called. We're just among us, placed among us by Satan as snares. You know, God's Word says that, that even that Satan can bring people in among you as a snare among you. And brethren, if you suspect that you might be one of those among other brethren, and you want to be part of this, ask God to take that diabolical, devilish stuff out of you and let him know you really want to be with us. If you're a kid who grew up in the church and you're privileged to be associated with the truth because you had a parent whom had, whom a, you had a parent whom God had called and chosen that that uh, makes you in a very special category of not being cut off from God the way the rest of the world is and yet 
That doesn't mean, oh, shoot, God took me out of the fun I wanted to have. No, if that's where you want to be, God will leave you in that, and you'll bypass the first resurrection in your second resurrection material, not first. Um, you know, but if you are getting the drift of it and you say, well, I want to be part of that first resurrection and be married to Jesus Christ and be part of that brideship, then you have to ask God for it. You have to want it and ask God for it. And you've got, you know, God can give that to you where somebody else in the world, they're just cut off from God. They don't even have the option. Um, now, if God starts to work with somebody in the world that's not, you know, that didn't grow up in the church, um, well, yeah, then if God sees a good response, the kind of response that he feels like, I can work with that person in the time we have left and bring them in, then, you know, that's God's option, and that's that's according to Scripture. John 6, we all know, well, we all should know, the long-timers know John 6, 44 and John 6, 65. None can come to Christ except the Father call him. And, um, you know, there was a scripture that uh, either Mr. Armstrong quoted earlier or um, that bounced across me in one way uh, that relates to the talk Mr. Armstrong gave tonight and relates to God's spirit. In fact, you know, it may have been in one of those uh Verses related to being scattered, because it, uh, oh yeah, it it's it it is in one of those proverbs. It's the next verse after in Proverbs twenty. This is brethren, regardless of whether you came in the church recently or long, long, long time ago, and whatever is happening with you now, here's a verse you should be very much aware of, because a lot of people missed state what the Holy Spirit does with us. And there is a proverb that relates to that. It's right after the one I read a moment ago from Proverbs 20 and verse 26 that says, A wise king scatters, scattereth the wicked and brings the wheel over them. He, he not only scatters them, he brings the wheel over them. He really punishes them. But the very next verse, verse 27, we're in the Proverbs, and sometimes they seem to just kind of jump around a little bit. Proverbs 20 verse 27 speaks about the Holy Spirit. Oh, well, let's see. Wait a minute. I'm sorry. It mentions the spirit of man. But even God, with God's spirit, can access the spirit of man in this way, like it says in verse 27. The spirit of man is the candle of the eternal, searching all the inward parts of the belly. But you know, if... Some who say, the Holy Spirit told me this or that. No, I wouldn't. The Holy Spirit is just a power. If you want to com <clears throat> compare it to something, you compare it to like the Internet, where you can get an email account or a messenger account, and you and another person can talk. But God's Spirit, through God's Spirit, God is able to talk to you through that Spirit. And it's going to be a still small Voice. It's not going to be like having a face-to-face -face conversation, you know, with God. He's not necessarily going to answer you like somebody in a face-to-face -face conversation would. But he's going to hear you in prayer. And through that spirit, he can give you the answer. Some fellows were asking me the other day, hey, how do you, how do you know God exists? Well, one of the answers to that is answered prayer. And a good... You know, you can prove it. Ask God things and it, and ask him to give you an answer on this or that. And boom, watch how things come into your head. Ask him again. Hey, Father, did you ask me this? You know, and then see if that answer stays part of the answer. Now, I know some of you out there are struggling with instability, with double-mindedness. And God can heal you of that and help you with that, too. But you need to ask him and tell him you want to be straightened out and smoothed over. Some of you are struggling with some sins. You're not even admitting our sins that are related to doctrines of this church. I don't want to beat anybody over the head with that at this moment. But you are not going to be, you know, in the, in the, 
either in the first resurrection nor accounted worthy to escape if you don't seek God and ask him to show you your secret sins. You've got to be, we have all got to be putting sin out of our lives. And to do that, we've got to know what sin is. God even says that lack of knowledge is not an excuse. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So if if you don't want to be destroyed, you need to do the opposite of having a lack of knowledge. Get busy, discern God's word, and then those things that once you learn, say, man, I got I to gotta stop this old bad habit or turn something around. And yeah, God realizes you may not be able to do that overnight, but he does expect to hear you every night saying, hey, I want your help with this. <clears throat> and then fill me with something that will you know, help me get away from this nasty habit that is a sin according to the doctrines of the church of God. And only an apostle can set doctrine in the church. So if people are wondering, what do I believe? This church, this group, this church group over here teaches this. You know, they say interracial marriage is okay, but God's end time apostle till the day he died was saying, mm -mm, no, no, it's not okay. I'm just picking one thing out of the air that one church made a real um, obvious sore thumb of itself and taking that as an issue and doing a study paper and using a lot of human reasoning and convinced a lot of people, oh, we don't need to believe God's apostle. You can believe these men that are called ministers over here in this big group. They don't have the, even though there may, even though there may be dozens of them on that committee, not a one of them is rank of apostle. That apostle has rank over them all, and only an apostle can set doctrine in church. So the rest of you that are playing church and trying to reset the wheel on doctrine, you don't have the authority for what you're attempting to do. I don't care how many degrees in the world you hold and whatever titles Dr. Hoopy Loop Blah you, you know, may have on your name. Uh, if you ain't got the fruits of an apostle, if God has not made you an apostle, and the apostle is shown by his fruits, and God has not, he has not established a new apostle, that would be so obvious, uh, there wouldn't be any question at all about it. Because a man, when God is doing the fruits of the work of an apostle through a man, he does that through the man before he gets the title. And that one man that turned the truths of God into uh, apostasy, he wanted that title of apostle so bad, he made himself a false apostle, which, you know, shame, 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 shame for him, a wonderful man, beautiful personality, a very much loved man, one many welcomed to see following in the steps of God's end-time apostle, and if he'd had <laughs> Uh, well, I'm not going to speculate on that but any further. But, friends, let's uh, wrap it up for tonight. Um, we got a late start because my closed caption thing wasn't working. We finally, thank you, got it working. And we'll have it ready to go in the morning when we uh, have Mr. Armstrong speaking from the same sermon again for the service a.m. to the U.S., p.m. to the U.K., 9.30 a.m. Central Time in the morning. He'll be speaking on God's church in action. And we will address that subject after Mr. Armstrong speaks as to how that relates to what is happening to God's church right now while it is vastly scattered and shamefully divided. We'll see you in the morning. God willing, and the creek don't rise. Um, thanks for joining me tonight, friends. Your host for the Friday night Bible study featuring this sermon excerpt by Mr. Armstrong has been yours truly, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Wish you a good night of sleep. Join us again in the morning. Uh, reference to 9.30 a.m. Central Time. We'll be back. Have a good night. Shabbat Shalom to all of you. Oh, and let's uh, tell you what. Let's close it out with that music that Mr. Armstrong closed many of his programs with. This one right here. Well, it'll be with this slide right here.
All right, Shabbat Shalom. We'll see you in the morning. 9.30 a.m. Central Time.